welcome to the Tectonic Takes Podcast. I'm your host, Ivan Ornelas. With me is a special guest. We've got uh, Danny from L3 Pod. How are you doing? Good, man. How are you doing this morning? Good. Thank you. Uh, I'm doing well. It's been a really nice month of June here. Uh, this is my first podcast here in my new house in Livermore. Still uh, living with my family, but uh, it's been pretty nice. It's a lovely area. Um, looking forward to getting to know it a bit more uh, now that most of the moving has been complete and it's nice to be back in the bay area and i'll be hopefully attending my first quakes game of the season uh sooner rather than later for sure man i'll, I'll see you out there man just hit me up yeah we're happy to hang out and also livermore is great with the wine country up there man i'm not sure if you're <laughs> how you how you feel about wine but pretty good wineries out there man so yeah right. pretty cool spot yeah i usually just drink uh, socially but it's definitely something i'll check out same with as you would if you lived in napa you're definitely gonna give it a try yeah um so uh, tell the listeners a little bit about uh, your podcast and uh and also uh, your uh, history with the quakes fandom yeah for sure man so yeah um my name is Danny or Daniel Benincourt. I am part of the L3 podcast. The L3 podcast is a, uh, we do an, a Liga MX uh, podcast, but it's all in English. Um, and rather than focusing on one specific team, we, we, we focus on the whole league. Um, but, you know, we, we kind of look at the main takeaway. Away. But not only do we focus on Liga MX, we also focus on, on, um, Mexican international team and we also focus on earthquakes because we all are from San Jose so mm -hmm. we all focus also on San Jose earthquake actually now that we have more Liga MX up there former Liga MX players kind of coming to come to um to play with MLS so we can do that as well so that's one of my podcast podcast, podcast I'm also in hold on one second is this thing tripping yeah I think uh, yeah. Uh, my mm -hmm. It is definitely tripping. All mm -hmm. right, this thing will fix itself in a second. Um, mm -hmm. I also have another podcast called Tales from the Head, and that's a mental wellness podcast with me and my friend Ryan Cooper, where we kind of talk about how what we're doing in order to um, to better ourselves mentally and you know reduce stress stuff like that. Stuff like that. I invite everybody to check out both of those podcasts. Once again, that's the L three Pod and Tales from the Head. All right. Thank you for that. And it's nice to have another experienced podcaster here. I know you do a great job there and I look forward to more content that you produce, especially since for people who are interested in Liga Mekis, but maybe don't speak Spanish all that well, or English is their preferred language. It's a really great, you know, way to learn about that league. And between the CONCACAF Champions League as well as transfers between the two leagues, it's definitely good to know more about both leagues. Yeah, for hold on. Hey, we're going to have to stop this for a quick second. Okay. My interface over here, it's acting. We might have to start all over. Yeah, that's um, fine. So, yeah, like I said, uh, great work with the podcasts and we'll definitely be Thank keeping you. track on what you're doing there uh to be honest i listen to a lot of podcasts so i, I there's very few podcasts that i listen to every single one but i do like to chip in and uh witness as much as possible especially within our quakes community <laughs> cool man appreciate that thank you right so on that note we do have the difficult task of talking about not the best result uh but sadly 5-0 losses aren't shocking anymore. San Jose Earthquakes are prone to big losses during the Matias Almeida era, which is running out of goodwill and excitement stored. And, you know, we give everybody their dues. We know what Almeida can bring to the table when he has his system in place and when he's got the player that the players that he's envisioned. And we've spoken before and we've spoken off podcast about how well, these are players mostly that Matias Almeida has worked with in the past that uh, he's brought in. They weren't necessarily his first choices either, perhaps. So it's a bit of a tough situation, and it's tough to put the blame on one person, but 
clearly something goes wrong when you lose 5-0. It doesn't happen all that often, and it shouldn't happen as often as it has for the San Jose Earthquakes these last few years. Yeah, I, I, and I feel like one of the reasons for that is just that the players are not there. You know, mm-hmm. Amida likes to the man-to-man, super um, high-impact um, uh, soccer, and unfortunately with the with the players that San Jose has, um, they weren't able to achieve that that vision, and you saw that in the first, um, the first and maybe second, well, the first season for sure, and definitely half of the uh, of the past season. But now we're in the third season. Like you said, Almeida did bring some of the players that he had worked with before that he's familiar with. These players know Almeida's uh, system. Um, obviously, the system works because Almeida has given results before. You know, in Mexico and Argentina. Um, just to name a few. So he does, the system does work, but the players are not there yet. And you can see that they, they're trying to meet the, the quality, but it's just not there. So definitely something is missing. I know in the past, like last year um, in the in the 2020 season, after losing like, what, 7-1, 5-1, back-to-back, like, um, Almeida, he, to bring up morale, he brought the, he took the team to, like, a, a little, like, a day trip or something to kind of boost up morale, and that kind of helped a little bit. But, you can tell the team the chemistry is there. You can tell the team loves playing for the guy, but chemistry does not win does not win uh, games. It doesn't get you three points, and it's ridiculous if you think about it. Um, in the last possible eighteen points, do you only picked up one point? You know, is there's something wrong there? You, you're seeing the team going from second to pl- from second place, possibly even tie for first place. Now, out of the playoff season, it's great. Um, yes, we still have a lot uh, a lot to go. For this um to the end of the season but earthquakes need to wake up and i'm not sure what it is you know you can you can tell that the striker situations in there everybody seems to be afraid to take a shot and it was and you can see that everybody was afraid of taking a shot us you know if you go back and look at the game um that we saw on tuesday versus orlando right and i think it's just one of those performances as tough as, as it is you have to uh if you're the coach, if you're Almeida, you tell the players, like, you have to put that behind you, especially with the uh, short time in between games. Uh, the key for this uh, team to move forward and to have any hopes of salvaging this season is goldfish memory. You have to move on to the next game as, sh- soon, as soon as possible. And with the schedule, that won't be a problem, uh, but uh, it is also potential that it'll snowball into this game and that's our biggest fear especially with a game that you always want to play well against in uh, the california classical well i mean one thing also to take into consideration is if you just look at the past two games Mm -hmm. um in in austin this was the first home game in austin with a brand new beautiful stadium shout out to my people over in the austin san antonio texas area yeah um so they had their home crowd you look yeah. at Orlando, it was packed with home crowd Orlando fans. And that brings it a huge factor. This is going to be the first Classico of the season um, here in San Jose. Not in, not in Stanford like we've seen in the past X amount of years. But this is going to be an Avaya and it's going to be a packed Earthquakes um, fan base. Which I think is going to bring a different perspective. Because there's a reason why the Earthquakes have a way better record at home than on the road. So I think, yes, you, you you cannot dwell on those past games because you can't do anything about that. You have to look forward. And I think bringing the aspects of being back home, the first um, um, Classico at home, at Avaya for the season, not only that, but this is going to be the first, what, game in a year and a half, almost two years, with full capacity, you know, because the, uh, the restrictions being lifted here in, in Santa Clara County, so it's going to be a completely different aspect. That energy is going to be there. And this is going to be a completely, hopefully, this is a completely different uh, earthquakes um, that we will be watching rather than what we've been seeing the past what, month uh, with them not scoring. But I'm excited for it. You have to move forward. And I and I think um, at the end of the day, you know, regardless, and you see this with any sort of derbies or any sort of rivalries, it doesn't really matter how you're doing you know, prior to that, you can be in, the two teams can be in last place. But once you play your rival, you you can tell that it doesn't matter. It's just for bragging rights and everybody gets elevated. And that's hopefully both teams bring it on Saturday. 
Right, and that's what we can hope for, especially for San Jose Earthquakes to bring it. Uh, before we go back into the Orlando game, uh, we have a few notes here about international football lately, as well as some big transfer news. So mm-hmm. for the preliminary Gold Cup roster, there's no JT Marcinkowski, but there is Kate Cal and Jackson Ewell. Given Jackson Ewell was on the roster for the CONCACAF Nations League, uh, despite some l- less than adequate performances, I think Jackson Ewell has a good chance of being in that finalized roster for the Gold Cup. Whereas Kate Cowell has, you know, it's longer odds for him, but uh, it's still exciting to see uh, their players, two of the better San Jose Earthquakes players, uh, be recognized and be on the radar for, even if it is going to be a B team for the U.S. Men's National Team for this Gold Cup, it's nice to see them involved. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Jackson Ewell, he, he's our captain mm-hmm. um, with the Earthquakes. I want to say he also captains uh he wears the band for the u.s national team i'm not really sure on that don't quote me on that one um but i think he did for the u23s yeah i think he did so he he does have the experience he has that um at a very young age and then with with kate cowell what he brings is potential you know Mm -hmm. kate cowell's not there yet he is amazing at 17 18 year old like yeah like he's way better than you know physical and and you see the potential but he's not fully groomed yet he's not there yet he's not a world-class player you see this well how he gets so desperate in the last couple of minutes taking shots that he's way out of you know his capability you know just trying to be the hero um so he's not there yet but with hopefully with the international um, with the international experience, that will kind of bring in a different aspect rather than, than Quake soccer. Um, but yeah, hopefully he does make that roster. Um, I don't see him playing the full 90 minutes or starting for the U.S., but I can definitely see him coming in the last couple of minutes. And I mean, this it's great seeing Quake's uh, players just being represented internationally. Yep, and I think as long as there is at least one quicks player there in the roster even if the results aren't always going our way in major league soccer at least that's a bright spot that we can dwell on and another bright spot is marcos lopez he's been pretty involved with peru uh he had a role in their win over colombia and the copa america it is a bit of an odd tournament uh with no guest team so they're rocking with just the 10 con member nations so 80% of the teams in the tournament will advance to the knockout stage. So as long as you don't finish last, it does put the pressure off a team like Peru, who you can sort of bank on winning at least one game. And they've done that against one of the better teams. So it's good to see what Marcos Lopez is doing. Absolutely. And and you can see how much it affects us here with the Quakes, how much we're missing him mm-hmm. um, in this past couple of games. And, I mean, Peru, unfortunately – Peru is stuck in a in a continent or league with such amazing football. You know, you mm-hmm. have uh, Brazil, Argentina, you got Uruguay, you got all these great teams that unfortunately is very is a very very hard um, league or confederation to advance. So unfortunately, teams like Peru, teams like Paraguay, you know, they kind of mm-hmm. get overshadowed. Ecuador even. They get overshadowed by these powerful teams, um, rightfully. But I think uh, Peru is always um, – you can never take him – you can never sleep on Peru. That's all I got to say about that. Yeah, and I would be remiss to not mention Uruguay for our buddy uh, Favi, uh, who I'm sure yeah. is breathing a sigh of relief. They won their first game of the tournament against Bolivia, and that's yeah. a team that, you know, definitely needed to be in. His boy Cavani, he got a goal there too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, his boy Edson, he's still unbelievably – that kid, uh, that kid, he's like my age, but Cavani <laughs> is just magnificent still at his age when a lot of people thought he was already like done and with, he's still seen, he's like, <laughs> do I dare call him a Cristiano Ronaldo? But maybe he's kind of like those key players where like age doesn't really affect them. They're still going to go out there and do what they can um, until they can't do it no more. Yeah. And do you have any other, uh, Thoughts from what we've seen so far from the Euro 2020 or Copa America tournaments. Do you have any picks to win? Oh man, Euros! Uh, I was everybody was talking about Turkey about them being the dark horse, but I guess everybody <laughs> that except for Turkey. But yeah, um, no, it's just again like these teams that you think they're you know this is what I love about the sport is that the teams that you think are gonna be great 
they're not performing like Germany, you know, Germany is like, right. oh, you know, and they're like barely made it out of their, out of their table. And then you have teams like, um, you know, that's like Italy and Spain who are kind of working, but they're so back up. But then I know where Port- I, right now I'm riding high on Portugal. And, I'm not, and, and just because, you know, I'm not because, you know, I'm, I'm Portuguese or anything like that. Cause I'm, I'm Mexican, but you know, um, or I'm a, I'm a CR seven fan or anything, but <laughs> the way they were playing, the way they still have their heart is still so good. And like they were making France look like a B team on what was that game? Like a couple of days ago. So I think Portugal is a team to keep an eye on. Um, and I think, um, you know, sure. Always pay attention to like, you know, your, your France and stuff like that. Cause they are the champions, but you know, don't forget about the other teams that, you know, they, they seem to sneak their way into, um, you know, quarterfinals and stuff. And as far as like, um, um, Copa America down in down South, I mean, it's just, um, yeah, they've been great games. Also, I was saying Paraguay yesterday with Chile and it's just great because I was having this conversation with, um, with my podcast a couple, a couple months ago with uh, somebody from Chile saying that, you know, Chile's, you know, golden ages are kind of fading away with their big name players. Um, yeah, Arturo but, Vidal, Alexis Sanchez. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, keep an eye on the new ones that are coming out. Um, so Chile might, the, you know, obviously you're seeing a rebuilding right now. Um, but don't count them out also and get ready for the future with Chile because I think they're also going to be a team that are, you know, they are going to be putting their um, their stamp on the World Cup and might be knocking out, you know, teams like Brazil, mm-hmm. Argentina, or Colombia, who we're so used to seeing at the World Cups every Chile year. Chile always play Argentina tough. Like, I didn't expect Argentina to beat Chile because I know, especially in the recent Copa Americas, that Chile has been able to hold their ground. They won two finals against Argentina, and they are able to do that again. Um, Brazil with that controversial win over Colombia yeah. as well with 10 minutes of stoppage time, but... Even if it's with a few lucky breaks like that, Brazil have the quality as well that I think they're the team to be in the Copa America right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, if Uruguay and Argentina can get their act together, they're the next ones up for uh, the Euro tournament. I, I still can't think uh, anything other than a France victory. I think France, like Portugal, they're battle tested. They didn't look their best at times because they were in such a tough group. Mm-hmm. And that's why I can see... France making it to the final and potentially winning it. I think the team to beat on the other side of the knockout bracket, it's not England or Germany. I think uh, it could be the Netherlands. They are another team that's looking really yeah. good. So I think I have a France-Netherlands final in my mind. But you can see all my uh, full predictions. I'll put on the link to the podcast description. Uh, I did a Euro 2016 not 2016 euro 2020 uh group stage review and a knockout prediction as well so be sure to check that out after the podcast and lastly finally back into some san jose earthquakes uh news the brazilian center back nathan nathan cardoso but he goes by nathan he was signed and this was confirmed about an hour and a half before we started recording and He's going to be joining the San Jose Earthquakes. He's a product of the Palmeiras Academy in Brazil's top flight. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's played his entire career in Brazil and Switzerland, a 26-year-old, six foot two center back. So he's going to add some physicality to that back line. And he's experienced through his time in his most recent club, FC Zurich. And we're going to see how he makes the transition from Europe to MLS. We had a... Uh, Swiss player uh, Francois Safalter a few years ago. He was a bit part player for San Jose Earthquakes. Hopefully Nathan will be able to establish himself a bit more, even if it's at the expense of maybe uh, either Tanner Beeson or Florian Youngworth, which, Mm -hmm. you know, we love those players and we think that they have contributed some good moments for us, but the reality is our defense is not doing so well. you follow up the first clean sheet of the season with a 5-0 loss. Uh, you have to consider those options. And it's not just because of that 5-0 loss, of course. Transfers take months of time and uh, preparation. But this has been coming, I think. Yeah, and you can tell that that back line has always been shaky. You mm-hmm. know, it's always been shaky. It's always been – and and it was – that weakness was exposed, unfortunately, on the Orlando game. You saw a lot of players ball-watching – not in position, N- miscommunication. That second goal that came in was a miscommunication. 
Um, so there's a lot of um, tweaks that have to be made on that back line. And hopefully with this new, with Nathan coming in, this will solidify that back end. Um, and also um, with that physique 6 2, you know, hopefully get some aerial, um, um, win some aerial battles, especially when it comes to free kicks or, or corners against the Quakes. So hopefully yeah. this improves and hopefully we can get him ready and out there in the pitch as soon as possible. And for those of you who are fans of either Tanner Beeson or Flo Youngward, or maybe even Alanya see, sees his play time reduced yeah. because of this uh, transfer, it's a good problem to have, to have four players who can start in MLS. Granted, they haven't always had great MLS games, obviously, you know, not to beat that dead horse, uh, but uh, it's a good problem to have that competition. Yeah, and not only that, but remember, Alanis is going back to Chivas pretty soon. Oh yeah, Chivas. Absolutely. Re- so there's your replacement right there. You brought in, you brought up how he can easily replace Alanis. We mm-hmm. might be seeing Alanis go back to Mexico. What by August, maybe after the All Star game. So, um, we'll see when that happens, and uh, hopefully, um, Nathan does become the um the replacement for Alanis because Alanis seems to be the best consistent player in the back line and when it comes to those um the three mexicans that um earthquake staff he's been the most consistent one compared to fierro and um and trophies yeah so i think that's your insurance policy if you're not able to work something out with chivas for a permanent transfer with alanis or for whatever reason you decide to move on without him even if you do have the option available so it's a smart move in that instance as well because if alanis for whatever reason he doesn't return quakes for 2022 you do need at least three there. If you didn't make this signing, you're down to two center backs, essentially. And one of them who's still very inexperienced in Tanner Beeson relative to other top teams in MLS when you think of their center back pairings. Exactly. So we'll get into the Quakes game against Orlando City now. They played in Exploria Stadium in Orlando. It did have some... Uh, inclement weather which produced a 30 minute d- delay initially and then there was a break in play between the 40th minute mark and then resumption of play to finish off the first half and uh, Orlando used the starting lineup of Brandon Austin and goal their back line of Kyle Smith Antonio Carlos Robin Jansen and Joao Moutinho no not that one and then in the midfield four from right to left you had Chris Mueller on the wing with Gino Urso and Andres Pereira in the center of the park with Benji Mitchell in the left wing position, and then their strike partnership of Daryl DK and Nani. Their use subs were Michael Halliday, Mauricio Pereira, uh, Oriol Russell, Alexander Alvarado, and Canadian international Tesho Ankindele. Their previous result for Orlando, it was officially an away game, but since Toronto play their away games also in Exploria Stadium, it was essentially a bonus home game for Orlando, and they were able to beat Toronto 3-2. With the Sounds of Earthquakes, they used JT Marcinkowski, Paul Marie, Flo Youngworth, Osvaldo Alanis, Tom Thompson, then their midfield partnership of Jackson Ewell and Yudson. Then you had Christian Espinoza, Chofis, and Chris Wondolowski in that uh, front four supporting the striker uh, Andy Rios. And their use subs were Abacasis, Beeson, Salinas, and Cowell. The main change from the last game was. They moved back to 4-2-3-1 after experimenting with the 3-4-1-2. So small sample size, but based on the last two games, the last two results, do you think that Almeida might go back to a 3-4-1-2 going forward? I think so. I think it was too much pressure for Andy Rios to to finish off, to play in the top. Um, I think that's um, also like starting Wando, that's like, for me, it was like unheard of, you know, and mm-hmm. then you can tell that um, after that weather break that Almeida was definitely going for a more attacking formation by bringing in Chase Salinas. We all know how great Chase Salinas and, and Wando play together um, and they link up together. Unfortunately, no magic was created um, for this game, but I can definitely see um, for this coming game be a more of a three, four, one, two formation and have dual attackers in the top um with i don't know maybe anti rios and kate cowell beginning the the game mm-hmm. I think be a, a good um 
I think that'll be a good um, lineup right there, especially for a team that's so hot like Galaxy, unfortunately. Right. And I think what was interesting is um, there was no space for Remedy in this lineup with uh, Tommy Thompson uh, moving into the lineup to fill into the left back, which moved Paul Marie to right back. And I think that was an interesting decision because uh, we posted a graphic on our social media accounts how Remedy has played so many minutes for the Sands of Earthquakes. And it's going to be interesting to see if uh, Remedy makes him return to the lineup. I think for the most part, he's been off to a good start with this new club. Mm hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like he he will start um, on this one. Obviously, this Tuesday game was experimenting like who uh, Ameda. I'm pretty sure he used it as an experiment to see who we can bring in, who can substitute with what with what what we have. So I can definitely see uh, Remini coming back in on that back line and just solidifying that that um, that back line a little bit more. Right. It's a tough opponent to experiment against. Orlando City are one of the top teams in the Eastern Conference mm -hmm. from last season, and they've resumed that role this season as well. Yeah. And unfortunately, maybe that backfired a little bit. Uh, the goal summary it started in the seventh minute. Uh, Floor Youngworth conceded a uh, penalty kick, which was drawn by Benji Michelle. Nani scored the penalty kick, made it 1 0. And then from there, it went from bad to worse. 16th minute, Benji Michelle. 2-0, assisted by Mueller. 31st minute, Daryl DK got in the act. This time, Nani, the assister. And then, early in the second half, 49th minute, Daryl DK got a brace. Nani got his second assist, third goal involvement. And then, lastly, at the very end, Benji Michel, the icing on the cake for Orlando. 5-0 with substitute Teshon Candele assisting. So, it was just... They scored early and often against the San Jose Earthquakes. It was the two danger men that we're most familiar with. Nani, you know, former Manchester United player, Portugal international. He is a very impressive player, and he's done very well during his time at MLS. And Daryl DK, just coming back from his loan spell at Barnsley, came close to earning promotion, but didn't quite work out. Uh, and now he's back in MLS, hopefully not for too long for our sake so we don't have to play against him again and for his sake because he's a good player and he's already proven that he can play in Europe. I mean, one thing you need to take away from this, yes, the, the scoreline is impressive um, and it <laughs> looks bad on, on the Quakes, but if you look back on the goals, they were mistakes. It wasn't like any skill. The first, the penalty was a mistake. Mm -hmm. um, well, Huge mistake. Well, Huge mistake. Se second goal also in the 16 minute. It was a miscommunication between who was it? Was it Flo also and and JT or I can't remember who who was shielding uh, Michelle. But bottom line is those two goals were were mistakes. Uh, I think even the one in the 49th minute was also miscommunication. So if you take away those goals, quicks, you know you have a 2-0. You know you have a 2-0. Win loss or loss yes um and then <laughs> also the other thing you need to take into consideration is once we've seen this in the past with quakes once they get on that 2-0 deficit early in the game quakes kind of lose their hope they kind of put their head down and they just look defeated if this would have been a completely different this would have been a completely different game if those two goals would not have been conceded so early and second if even if the first penalty if the penalty would have been blocked by jt because he did guess nani's spot uh, he's just going to get there with the with the shot. If he would have blocked that, this would have been a completely different game, um, uh, Quakes. So, yes, it looks bad in paper, but if you look back, it wasn't all there. It wasn't because Orlando was, oh, my God, his team. Orlando capitalized on what the chances they had. Any other play you see, um, there's only, like, one or two shots that really tested JT. The rest were kind of just mistakes, like I said. So that's one thing you need to take away from this before we start looking – at the score um another thing also to take away from this um from this game is also this you going from san jose who has somewhat of a good um temperature you going you go down to texas where it's like a hundred and something super humid and then you go to orlando where it's even more humid you know was more rain so the weather and the traveling definitely adds up two you know two days break between games are super tiring especially in those so demanding weather like um um 
atmospheres. So I think now with the team a little bit more rested, yes, it's going to be a, a, a big challenge, but I wouldn't give Orlando all the credit just yet. Um, you also got to take into consideration the mistakes the Quakes are doing that hopefully they get it together for this game um, coming up on Saturday. That's an important uh, thing you mentioned about not just the traveling, but also the weather, the combination of cities there. And I'm usually of the belief is like, hey, this is MLS. This is every team has to deal with. Like, it can't be an excuse. And I'm not using that excuse when it was such a convincing win for Orlando, but it was a factor. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, mm -hmm. if you think about it, you know, from San Jose to Austin, that is a good three, four hour flight. Yeah. You know, um, and you go into super humid super uh, super humid weather and then from there you go into another four hour flight into orlando where it's even more humid and now from orlando you're flying back to um you're basically going from east coast to the west coast that's a good five hour a six hour flight so it, it sure is every team goes through it it's um everybody does it but back to back it, it does bring in the factor it does bring in um something psychologically for these players which i mean there are professionals who should be able to you know it's not like there's the first time traveling you know they already know you know they they know how it, how the weather is down in texas they know how the weather is down in florida they know how long it's those travels but it's still yeah. something kind of think about and adjusting you know with the time changes and stuff like that it's something that you know you take into consideration no excuses at the end of the day but it's just something also to kind of think about um when we see these results and a quick look at the stats here uh, i'm not going to read them all off but uh, the two yellow cards in this match were yutin and alanis i think yutin's been picking up a few yellow cards that's one thing to keep an eye on is that while the quakes they led in categories such as possession passing accuracy and corners it's just the same old story. They haven't done nearly enough with the ball. And the main telling stats for me are the shots and the shots on target. Orlando had 18 shots to the San Jose Earthquakes, 12. So just from total shots, they scored almost one third of their total shots. Mm -hmm. And then shots on target. San Jose Earthquakes just had one, which is not good. If you take 12 and you only hit one, that's not good at all. And Orlando they had eight shots on target so they scored five goals from eight shots on target that is very efficient and part of that comes from the mistakes that sounds earthquakes committed which allowed for those easy, easier opportunities although orlando did create three chances in this game and in that second goal in particular they were focused on dk and then they were able to get it off to benji michelle the 23 year old orlando native had a terrific game for his hometown club and it was sort of his, um, you know, he was the X factor for them because when you're going into it, what Nani and uh, Daryl DK were capable of, Benji Michelle comparatively flies under the radar. Like if you were to ask me before the match, who would be the third best player for Orlando in that game? I would probably more say Chris Mueller than Benji yeah. Michelle. So pray where it's due, like other players for Orlando were able to step up it's not just their star players with European experience. No, and, and the thing with names like Nani and names like um like it shows that they they draw players to them. Mm -hmm. You saw Nani getting double team. You saw the you, and you saw how they closed up. There is a there's a reason why he only scored one goal. Um but by drawing these players in also creates opportunities for other players. And we're gonna see this again on Saturday unfortunately with the names like Chicharito. Mm -hmm. like, um, Dos Santos. Uh, Alvarez, Dos Santos. Alvarez, now Alvarez also, Efrain Alvarez, who, who is also getting in there. So these t players are going to come in. They're going to draw defenders. And what's going to happen is it's going to create more opportunities. So that's something you can keep an eye out. Everybody's going to be looking at Chicharito and Dos Santos and Alvarez for scoring goals. But you can see how well they're going to be marked and how they're, that's going to create op uh, opportunities for other players that kind of fly under the radar who can still, you know, at the end of the day, can still score in there. So, yes, you can be mesmerized by these big-name players, but you also need to see, like, sometimes being a great, a big-name player doesn't necessarily mean scoring. It also means creating and pulling the attention to yourself so your uh, teammates can also score in there. Because at the end of the day, 
you know, key players do not win the game. The team wins the game, and goals and goals needs to be scored in order to win the game. Right. It reminds me a bit of how in the NBA playoffs, uh, particularly the Jazz Clippers series, how mm-hmm. th- they were able to get open looks to players like Terrence Mann, who ultimately had that big game that eliminated the Utah Jazz. Yeah. And it's all about getting those contributions from all around. And granted, the San Jose Quicks haven't had too much going forward to begin with, so you're not getting too much from key players or you know the supporting cast. But hopefully we'll get there again. Uh, The man of the match for me, I'm going to agree with the MLS Team of the Week selection. Uh, Nani, he had one goal, two assists. Uh, He was, he led by example. He was the danger man. He wasn't the only one as we just covered, but I think he was definitely the driving force behind this Orlando attack. Uh, Michel probably should have gotten a nod in that 18 along with Daryl DK who was on the bench. But ultimately, it was uh, you could pick any one of those three players for Orlando for the man match. Uh, did any Quakes player stand out? I honestly don't think so. No, just for like negative reasons. <laughs> you no, know, like not taking the shots, not creating the plays. You know, not you know doing any individual plays. You know, you were seeing eight shots only. I'm sorry, twelve shots and only one on target. Like. These shots were just being taken from random places on the pitch and being thrown to fifth and sixth row on on, on the benches. So, it, it the one key, the one thing I took away from this, as far as quakes goes, is that we need to find that striker. We need to find that person who is going to be confident to take the shot. Regards, it doesn't even matter if you test the goalkeeper or not. Get the shots on target. Create rebound. Create. Keep your keep the opponents on their toe. Um, and I think that's what Quakes have been missing, not just this season, but for the last two or three seasons, just that oh, absolutely factor, just that finishing factor is what the Quakes really need. And again, I say this over and over, but it's the truth. It, it is noticeable in this past couple of games, um, especially versus Orlando. You saw nobody wants to take the shot. Everybody's kind of like looking mm-hmm. for like, who's going to make the play or anything, take the shot. If you have the opportunity, just take the shot, get the rebound. You, you have Wando in there. He's going to try to take a shot. You know, if it's within the five, 10 yards from the pit, from the goal, he's going to try and do something to create it, but you just need to create that mayhem. You need to create um, those opportunities and you got to create something out of, uh, out of nothing. So and I think more individual plays need to be done. And again, just having more confidence in taking those shots, even if they're, uh, you know, if they don't go in, you know, even if it's a, you don't test a goal pe- uh, goalkeeper, uh, at least you're on target and not off target. Ben, don't break. I think that's the main area of improvement I want to see defensively. And we saw it against LA Galaxy in the first game where they weathered a few storms. They had good opportunities. JT Marskowski had to make a few big saves, but they've conceded a lot of early goals within the first 10 minutes and that unfortunately in these bigger losses have led to a second or even third goal pretty quickly after that too so that's just something to work on and it's a mental thing it's a a communication thing it's a whole lot of factors that have to go into that um any other thoughts on this game before we go into the uh mls standings no man just i i i hope the quakes can you know can shake it off and move on for for the game on saturday and uh, hopefully this is the the last of the multiple um losses that we got so used to last year um, right so hopefully this is the turnaround hopefully um it's a new team that we see on saturday versus the galaxy Right, and if you want our fan base to not be pessimistic and to believe that this team is better than these results, then you can have one bad loss of this caliber. This 5-0 loss was the biggest loss of the season. Uh, It was only the second time Quakes conceded three or more goals in the match this season, the other being the Sporting Kansas City. So a lot. there's been a lot of tough losses, but that can – I don't want to see 5-0 or – a margin of five goals or more again this season if quakes are really going in the right direction yeah for sure so and 
Thanks again to everyone who's participated in our uh, MLS Fantasy League. We'll provide an update in our following podcast. Uh, we're moving right along into the uh, Western Conference standings. We have Sounders on top at 24 points. Uh, right now we're at the point of the season where m- very few teams have played the same amount of games. So I'm just going to go by points. I'm not going to mention how many games to play each team has. But uh, Sporting Kansas City in second with 20 points. LA Galaxy, they were steadily climbing up the table, and now they're in third with 18 points. Rounding out the uh, playoff spots currently, we got the Colorado Rapids in fourth, Timbers in fifth, Dynamo in sixth, and Real Salt Lake in seventh. Uh, And then below the playoff line, we got LAFC in 12 points, uh, level with Real Salt Lake, Minnesota with 11 points, San Jose Earthquakes in 10th with 10 points, but more... uh, Notably for me, they have the tied worth, tied worst goal difference in the Western Conference with the Vancouver Whitecaps at negative six. So that's not good. And then rounding out the bottom, you got Austin, Whitecaps, and FC Dallas, surprisingly, at the bottom, although they are level on points with Whitecaps. So uh, I think you can't have any complaints on where San San Jose Earthquakes are at the table and I think just on points to be only two points off the playoffs, it shows that, you know, that should be motivation enough to find any way possible to try to turn things around. I mean, if you look at the top three teams, one thing they have in common is that they've been consistent. Mm -hmm. Consistent. uh, You said it with Galaxy slowly climbing up. That's, you know, that's just proves consistency uh, over and over in the past nine games that, you know, or nine weeks that this tournament has been going on for. The the one thing that does suck about Earthquakes is, yes, we're outside right now, the playoffs looking in. We still have, what, 30 more games to go in the season? or 20, 25-ish. 25, yeah, yeah okay, mm-hmm. around now. Um, mm-hmm. But you want if they don't start scoring, because Quakes prior to, they can lose by a bunch, but I think the biggest, they always end up winning by only one or two goals um a game anyways so we hopefully this deficit of goal differences does not hurt the quakes down the down the line once it comes to playoffs once it comes down to like you know you're tied and you're not going to make it because the goals concede um earlier in the in the season so hopefully it this isn't the case and hopefully they turn around it doesn't become like an issue for us but this is a motivation because we went from first, you know, from first place and rather consistently staying up there in the top three where we, I believe we belong. We're now outside and we're kind of, you know, um, yeah. Now we're, we're what next to Austin, a brand new team that just started that took some mm-hmm. of our players. Like, come on, do you need to, you guys need to step it up. Um, I'll have to disagree there. And while I agree that like, you shouldn't be competing with the likes of Austin, I think Austin themselves, like they haven't necessarily embarrassed themselves. Uh, they're in the middle of the road as far as expansion teams within this recent era of MLS have gone. Like they're doing okay. Um, and I don't believe that San Jose Quicks belong in the top three. I think best case scenario for me going into the season was maybe fourth and i think sixth or seventh was most likely going to be where they would finish should they make the playoffs i still think teams like the sounders scoring kansas city um and the timbers who are a bit lower in fifth they're overall better rosters and one thing i noted about the la galaxy after they played us the first time is that they've gone smarter with their roster construction i think that they've focused a bit more on different areas of the field. I think Jonathan Bond, and we'll go into that more detailed as well in the preview, is probably the best goalkeeper they've had since their last MLS Cup. And that may that perhaps includes uh, their Panamanian international, whose name escapes me right now. I'm at Benedo, I think. But uh, You're right. yeah. I think... Sands Earthquakes are still, you know, playing catch up and, you know, that's okay. Like we didn't expect them to be the top of Western Conference, but they've got work to do. Uh, any other team uh, surprise you in their standing in Western Conference? Um, it's Minnesota, actually. Mm-hmm. Minnesota uh, plays very well. They have a very similar style to the Quakes. Um, right. 
So as that brings him for, you know, whenever they play the Quakes, I think it's a very, very good matchup. But I think Minnesota, you know, being outside of the playoffs, um, it's kind of like, that's kind of surprising. But I think you, you said it perfectly. Like, there's only two or three points that separate, you know, Quakes are in 10 plays right now. And you see the uh, you see tempers. The, uh, Last the place are only five points out of the playoffs as well. Yeah, so it's not that far stretch, especially so early in the season. Or I shouldn't say so early anymore, but maybe like in the fourth, on the first, the fourth, end of the first third. third of the season. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so it, it's still a chance for improvement. Um, and one, you know, one or two games, you turn around one or two games, and you'll see Quakes right back up there in, in the top. Um, and that's at the end of the day, morale. Uh, to, if you really want to lift up for morale and you know faith in the team, you have to start winning. And you know maybe it's time now for the Quakes to turn around this uh, this weekend, and from there start slowly climbing up. Because if you you know if you start playing scenarios, um, if Galaxy was to lose points versus the Quakes this weekend, I mean Galaxy stays the same, but that puts uh, Quakes in, with 13 points, and that depending on the results for over the weekend, they're back in the playoff positions. Yeah. So. Uh, brief look at the Eastern Conference, New England Revolution, led by uh, Carlos Gill, who is currently, you know, if the season were at the end of the day, he would be the MLS regular season MVP. Uh, they're on top with 23 points. Orlando City, as we mentioned, uh, they're doing very well this season, 18 points in second place, just ahead of Philadelphia Union on goal difference in third, running out the playoff spots for them, New York City, Columbus Crew, who said goodbye to their stadium, Maffrey Stadium, uh, with one other, uh, Dos Acero. Uh, they're in fifth. Nashville and DC United round out the playoff spots. Below the playoff line, uh, New York Red Bulls, Montreal, Atlanta, and then in the single digit points column, uh, Inter Miami still struggling, Cincinnati, Toronto, and Chicago Fire. Any uh, thoughts about the Eastern Conference? Atlanta and and Miami, man. Atlanta, yeah. Um, after winning that, you know, having that magnificent year, winning and you know creating an environment over there, um, falling back, you know, it's, it's kind of devastating. Uh, just as a as a fan of the of the sport, and same thing with Miami, you kind of want to refer this team because of who their owner is, mm -hmm. uh, our friend Fernando Fiore, who does commentary for them. You're right. As, our, as a you know, Mexican fan, not saying that I, I, I like Rodolfo Pizarro, but you always come to cheer <laughs> for, you know, for the Mexicans. So it, it, it's very devastated for those two teams, just for the amount of potential they have and just um, for what they did in the past. But other than that, I mean, those teams are where they have to be. You know, Asheville in sixth place, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. Good for them. Yeah, I think New England Revolution, they're the most snake-beating team in MLS history. They've been to so many finals, and they've lost in every single way. Yeah. But yet, yeah, there is a bit of hope because their team is doing so well, and they're able to go far in the playoffs when they were the eighth seed last season. So we'll see what they can do if they can keep this up. And uh, Orlando City, uh, I think... They just added to their resume with this win, and they are going to be a team to look out for in the Eastern Conference. Absolutely. And now we finally move into the uh, LA Galaxy game coming up tomorrow as we're recording this on Friday. And just a brief recap of how the first game in uh, Carson went. Galaxy, uh, they, uh, I'll just briefly go through their lineup. It was Bond and Goal, the back line of Arajo, Steres, Depuy, and Villafania. They had Dos Santos and Kleschen, Cameron Dunbar, Efrain Alvarez, and Kevin Cabral for the forward. It was Chicharito up top, but their game changer was when they brought in Samuel Grandseer, and he was he put their level of threat to another level. And keep in mind that Sebastian Lightgit was away on international duty, and uh, Williams was suspended due to red cards. That might shake up their lineup a bit more. I think Legge is no longer a meme. He's no longer that player that is called up by the U.S. men's national team and people think, oh, wow, what is this guy doing here? Um, but he is a solid player for club and country, and I think he's going to be another player to look out for for the San Jose Earthquakes. Um, looking at their lineup that they used in that last game, uh, 
what do you ex expect to be the changes uh, for this matchup besides, of course, Marcos Lopez being unavailable? Um, with the plates? Yeah, I, I think it'll probably stay the same, to be honest. Yeah. Um, I, I maybe I would probably put Andy Rios in for Kate Cowell. I wouldn't mm -hmm. start Kate Cowell. Um, I'll, I'll start it with Andy Rios and then bring Kate, like, maybe in the last 30 minutes. Um, then another person also that I would like to see there more would be uh, Paul Marie. But yeah, Paul Marie will definitely likely be involved uh, as one of the fullbacks. If yeah. Chris Wondolowski does play and they stick to the more often used formation of 4 2 3 1, do we see Andy Rios as the top striker? with Chris Wondolowski in behind him, and then you yeah. have perhaps Chofis and Espinosa on the wings? Absolutely. And yeah. especially Wando playing, I, won't, I don't want to say like a false nine, but definitely yeah. like behind Andy Rios. Because again, Wando, when he lacks in skills, he makes up for poultry. And he is a magnificent poultry. He will go in there, he'll throw a hip, a leg, a calf, whatever. Um, and he will, and he fires up that top, um, um, that top line for the Quakes. So I'll love to see him in. And of course, if you're going to bring in Wanda, you have to bring in Shea Salinas also. Because again, like I said earlier, they click up so well. And there's a reason why Wando is the number, is the top scorer of all times for, for the Quakes. And Shea Salinas is the top assist or has the top uh, title for top assist in the league. So um, yeah, other than that, I, I think uh, Quakes will also go in there with, with Eric uh, Remedy. Mm -hmm. Um, I think he, you know, he didn't play. Did he play uh, versus Orlando? If they did, I mean, I don't think he played versus Orlando. No, I don't think so either. I mean, everybody. It, I mean, come on, Quakes <laughs> did not play. Period. So yeah. Really um, but yeah, I'll, I'll like. I think I would like to see him start. Maybe put Paul Marie for Justin. Yeah, and if Justin does play, uh. They tried man marking Daryl DK with Butin. It didn't work. So yeah. I wouldn't try that against Chicharito. Yeah. So I think they would have to rethink that. Galaxy also last time out, they showed a lot of grit against the Whitecaps and mm -hmm. focus near the end where Javier Hernandez put them up to make it 1-0. And it, as the pressure was rising from the Whitecaps, they eventually got their equalizer. And yet Efrain Alvarez scored one minute after that. So the Galaxy still escaped Rio Tinto Stadium, the current temporary home for the Vancouver Whitecaps, with mm -hmm. three points to keep them high up the table. So LA Galaxy, they are sharper than perhaps in their first game. So we really do have to play well. Yeah, and, and you're going to see Chicharito bring in um... – Bring in, um, um, drawing attention to him, which will allow Efrain Alvarez. But now, since Efrain Alvarez has become the the hot name for the Galaxy in this past week or two, on the, this past week, I should say, you're gonna see him being marked a little bit more. So, it, it is gonna be interesting, um, how what the Galaxy bring in, uh, for Saturday game. But, um, I think Quakes are gonna step it up. They have to. All right, yeah. There's no better time to step up than against your rivals, so we'll see what happens. The last thing I can think of that could be a factor in this game was the Quakes played Tuesday, and the Galaxy, along with the rest of the league, played Wednesday. Yeah. Um, do you think that one extra day will make a difference? I I think that was more of a traveling day, to yeah. be honest. Um, and I already saw... Um... Um, I seen some of the Galaxy players yesterday already walking around downtown San Jose. I know where they're staying at, so um, <laughs> I already saw him. So Danny they, the Scout. <laughs> yeah, I already, I already know where they at. You know where they're going to eat. But yeah, I already saw him yesterday walking around downtown. They posted all over the social media, also. So you know, mm -hmm. Vancouver to San Jose. That's the quick two two and a half hour flight. So, uh, right here. so uh, they were in uh, Salt Lake. Oh, I'm sorry, Salt Lake. Oh yeah, two hour flight. Yeah, no <laughs> problem. Yeah, um, so they're here. Um, they're already getting used to. I'm pretty sure they're at uh, PayPal already warming up for okay. tomorrow's game. So yeah, I think they're gonna. You know, they're here ready. Yeah, 
Quakes also get the has the extra hour or something, but that was just traveling time. I'm right. Sure. So I feel like both these teams are going to be um, in the same as far as energy wise. They're going to be about the same. Um, right. But it all depends on the confidence. And you're seeing one team coming in with super confidence, and the other one's kind of kind of shaky. But again, I think this is going to be a key factor. Also, not the weather, not the traveling, anything. It's the fact that San Jose is finally playing uh, at PayPal to a full capacity versus a rival. And it, it's the, I'm not saying that, oh, this never has happened before at, at you know, at home because um, they always play in Stanford. But this is going to be like the first summer one, the big one leading up with the fireworks and everything like that. First time at, at PayPal um, for the June, July classic or summer classic, if you will. So I think the fans – it's going to be a huge factor for the Quakes. Yeah, that could be a bigger factor than that one extra day. Um, my prediction for this game, I'm going to go with a 1-1 draw. How about you? I'm going to go with 2-1. 2-1 Quakes. Okay. I feel like Quakes are known for like those last minute, you know, in the 30, you know, in stop. Goonie time. time. <laughs> yeah, Goonie time. And you're going to see Wando take off his shirt and run into the ultras. And it's going to be it's going to be a fun game. Um, so I, I see a 2-1. <laughs> yeah <laughs> and i'm just thinking like well what if it's like a 4-0 but no we're gonna, <laughs> two one. we're gonna go with two one quakes right and this will be an important game to get something out of at least a point preferably three uh their month of july they got minnesota united away they got rapids and uh sporting kansas city so that's three away games in a row uh they will have a two-week break between minnesota united and colorado rapids so that'll be kind of their bye week uh then they'll finish up the month at home to Houston Dynamo before heading up to Seattle. So those are all tough teams, and uh, it's only going to get tougher from there. And that'll tell us a lot about whether or not San Jose Earthquakes are playoff ready, playoff caliber. Absolutely. And, I mean, yeah, I, like I said earlier, Minnesota plays the same style as the Quakes, so that's gonna always going to be a, a good game. And then if you really want to climb, if you, start, if you really want to start making um, – climbing the table and make it to playoff positions, you have to win for these teams. All these teams that you're going to play in July are your rivals, and they're all ahead of you, so you need to step it up. Right. And uh, thanks for all the fan support for this podcast, and thank you to all our Patreons. If you want to join our Patreon, our link will be in the podcast. Uh, we have some Patreon-exclusive content there, and uh, we will be getting more fan questions in for the podcast following the California Classical for LA Galaxy. And we also want to quickly thank our sponsors, uh, Roughneck Scarfs, official scarf supplier to MLS, USL, and US Sco- Soccer. Get custom scarves to your group or team at roughneckscarves.com. And if you're tired of the same old uniforms and cookie care templates from Nike and Adidas and looking for a complete custom kit for your youth club, Sunday League squad, adult, or pro team, Icarus FC can help you create the kit of your dreams at an affordable price. Let them help you design your custom kit today at IcarusFC.com. And once again, we want to thank uh, Danny for coming in to f- fill in for this podcast. Um, where can we find you on social media? Yeah, man, you can find me on Twitter at DannyE3P or on Instagram at Danny Shank. Um, make sure to check out my podcast website at the L3podcast.com. That is E-L-T-H-R-E-E podcast.com. Um, and also check out my other podcast, Tales from the Head. Um, if you go into my social medias again on Twitter or on or on IG, you'll see links to to those podcasts also. But that's Danny E three P on Twitter and Danny E Shank on on Instagram. And say hi to me. I'm always up to talk and talk back and have a good time. Right, and we'll be sure to put those links in our podcast description below. And that'll do it for this podcast. So we'll see uh, sh- shortly if uh, San Jose Earthquakes do have that goldfish memory, able to wipe that Orlando game from memory, even if our fans can't, uh, and get a result in the California Classical round two. But as always, go Quakes. And if you guys see me at the stadium, come say hi. I'm usually wearing these red glasses. So come say hi. Um, I love to meet everyone. Yeah, sounds like a plan. All right, have a good one.
Thank you.